Do you want to be healthier, yet you just don't know what to do? All these shows telling you this and that, but nothing seems to work. Well, listen close. Golden State Media Concepts has got something great for you. The health and wellness podcast dedicated to workout trends, healthy eating habits, diet, and everything about healthy living. Join us in our banters as we help you not just live life to the fullest, but live it to the healthiest. Health and Wellness Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Alex. Today, we are going to talk a little bit about milk. It is no great love of my life. I only tend to like it if I'm eating it with cookies, so I only get milk with my treats unless I am putting it in my caramel macchiatos. So I make those at home. And those are literally like half milk and largely sugar. Although I have been dialing the sugar back recently, so I'm rather proud of myself there. But if you also don't like milk, or even if you absolutely love it, we're going to talk about how good it really is for us. The different types of milk, lactose intolerance, some milk alternatives, how calcium really works for us. And then last, we're going to talk about how to use milk externally, even for those of us who do not generally ingest it. So first, we're going to talk a little bit about how good it is for us. I did a bunch of research into this because I have high cholesterol and my LDL's been working on it, but you know, all that cheese I eat is going to cause some problems somewhere. Nothing can taste that good and not be bad for you somehow. So milk it's it's very complicated. So there are different sides for this, and there's a lot of different research. And if someone asked you to go and write a paper that says milk is great for you, you could easily do that. But also if someone says milk is bad for you, you can easily do that as well. So according to the Dairy Education Board, milk is a deadly poison. That is because even though they are called the Dairy Education Board, it's a special interest group. And they are very anti-milk. So one of the things I like to caution folks on when we're trying to learn things about whether things are good or bad for us is to try to get it from an impartial source. We don't want to go to like a vegan website or a pro-dairy website. You're really going to want to check health websites because the important component is not whether milk is good or evil per se, but you know, whether it, what its impact is on your health. So if you go to someone to find out if it's good or evil, then you're going to be checking bias sources kind of. But if you just are looking at it from a health aspect, then you're going to get a better well-rounded picture. I like to look at journal articles for that as well from peer reviewed scientific journals. And that helps me sort out the wheat from the chaff really. So for milk, a lot of people say that cow milk has cancer-causing hormones and that the dairy industry is just trying to keep that bottled up. But if you talk to nutritionists, a lot of them will say that people thrive on milk and it can be good for helping us lose fat or to build muscle. So we're going to start with whether milk is a fat-burning food. This is a health and wellness podcast, so we're going to go in hard on that one. So they're not actually sure. <laughs> they did a six-month study at the University of Tennessee, and they found that overweight people who drank three or more servings a day of calcium-rich dairy lost more belly fat than people who followed a diet that was very similar to that, except they only drank one or fewer glasses of milk per day. They also found that calcium supplements did not work as well as milk. 
So remember we've talked before about the importance of getting these vitamins and minerals for your recommended daily allowances through your food rather than through supplements. So why is it like that in the case of milk and calcium supplements? The researchers believe that calcium may increase the rate at which your body burns fat, but other active compounds in dairy like milk proteins also provide an additional fat burning effect. So it's not just the calcium that's in the milk. It's also those proteins that help you build muscle and to help you get rid of fat. The more muscle that you have, the higher your muscle percentage, then the faster you're going to be able to burn fat as well. So make sure that we start with our diet and go from there. We're not going to be able to do it just with working out. The diet is there to start us off and then also to support us as we go through our fitness goals. So if you're doing it like I do, where I usually just drink it with a bunch of sugar, whether that's cookies or the caramel and the caramel macchiatos, I have to be really careful with that. And I try to balance that with eating some fiber and protein to help my body deal with all of the fructose that's going through there as well. So does it build muscle? Absolutely. It does help you build muscle. They're kind of going back and forth about the fat, but those milk proteins are really in there and it really does help you build muscle. Now, the last thing I want to drink when I've been working out really hard is a glass of milk, but you can mix your protein powder in with your milk and drink it like a smoothie or something. The best time to cheat on your diet is after a workout anyway. So we're not going to go full cheating on it, but, you know, having some milk with like maybe a scoop of ice cream in there with it is going to help you get that protein powder down and help you, if you don't, if you're like me and you don't like the taste of milk, help you get the milk down as well. So milk is one of the top muscle foods that we can have. It's 20% whey protein and 80% casein protein. So there's those of the two types of protein in there. Um, milk is not entirely protein, but these are good quality proteins Although whey is a fast protein, it's broken down really quickly into its amino acid components and then just gets absorbed right into the bloodstream. So it's going to be excellent to help restore some of that in your body right after your workout, whereas casein is digested more slowly. So it's giving your body a steady supply of protein, but for a longer amount of time and in smaller amounts. It's kind of really metering it out for you. So in between your meals and while you're sleeping, the casein is working, whereas right after your protein, as soon as you eat it, whey is going to go ahead and go right through you into your bloodstream. So since milk has both of those proteins in it, it's a really good, essentially you're taking a shot of muscle building proteins every time you drink some milk. Hormones in milk. So a lot of people are worried about hormones in their milk, but as long as you're not injecting milk into your body, then you should be okay. So in 1993, the FDA approved the use of growth hormones, RBGH, in cattle, and that resulted in cows being able to produce a lot more milk at a lot lower cost to dairy farmers, and that is also why milk is cheaper in the grocery stores. But RBGH also boosts milk's concentration of an insulin-like growth factor, and that hormone has been linked to cancer. Unlike steroid hormones, which you can take by mouth, RBGH and IGF have to be injected to have any effect on you. That's because the process of digestion destroys those protein hormones. Since BGH isn't active in humans, even if it were absorbed from drinking milk, it shouldn't cause any health effects. That wouldn't make any sense scientifically. The real issue is that IGF-1, so that insulin growth hormone that helps different types of cells to grow, and some studies have found that IGF-1 levels that are higher then the normal range may influence the development of some types of tumors, such as prostate, breast, colorectal, and other cancerous tumors. But other studies that were performed after that were unable to confirm those reports or the 
link between those relationships wasn't strong enough to really be determined as causal. They also found that people who drank milk each day, whether that was cow's milk or soy milk, had higher levels of IGF-1 in their blood than people who drank little or no milk. They were about 10% higher. So that really suggests that it's not necessarily the cow milk itself that's doing it, but maybe some other proteins and minerals and other factors that are in a couple different types of milk, whether they're plant-based or come from animals. I thought that that was really interesting. And they really concluded that right now there's no clear reason to think that drinking milk with or without RBGH treatment is going to increase your IGF-1 levels in a way that is going to cause cancer um, or other health effects. That is directly from the American Cancer Society. So I encourage you to check out their page and see what you think about it. They go some more into some scientific reviews as well. Now, while those hormones are not necessarily bad for us, if you are more anti-cow's milk from a spiritual or an ethical perspective, it's really not good for the cows. Some Canadian researchers found that cows who were given those hormones were more likely to contract an udder infection called mastitis. So it's an infection of their the cow's breast cells, more or less, their udder cells. I've seen it in cows growing up on a farm myself, and it's, it just looks kind of gross. And when they get those infections, they tend to treat them with antibiotics, which is another concern that a lot of people have in their food, especially in their milk. No one can really agree so far as to whether antibiotics in cow's milk leads to antibiotic resistance in humans. So people keep going back and forth on it. They have found, you know, some studies in one direction, some studies in the other, but nothing concrete enough for the general scientific community to fully agree across the board. And sometimes that just happens with science. It means that there's something else that we're not looking at that we haven't discovered to be the true underlying factor yet, or it's just not a problem. So we're going to keep doing research on that until we find out the answer. In the meantime, if it still bothers you, you can get antibiotic-free milk and also milk like that tends to have no hormones added. Remember, hormone-free does not mean anything. It's no hormones added that is important on those labels. For milk from different specialty grocery stores, so Trader Joe's has it if you have a Trader Joe's near you. Whole Foods tend to have it. Um, anywhere that has like organic milks will generally carry it. We're going to go on a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about the different types of milk. Are you looking to learn more about the latest trends from the fitness world? Are you confused by all of the different trends that are out there? The GSMC fitness podcast is the place for you. The GSMC Fitness Podcast is the place to come for people of all skill and interest levels. Join us as we explore the latest trends in the fitness world. Does that new exercise really work? Should I try yoga? Whatever your question, chances are good you'll find an answer on the GSMC Fitness Podcast. talking about milk and whether it's really good or bad for us in addition to some of the myths about milk and seeing where science stands on those. Now we're going to talk about the different types of milk. So there are like four main types I'm going to say. It's going to be low-fat milk, 1% milk, skim milk, 2% milk, and whole milk. Do these really help us or hurt us in either direction? And what do they actually really mean? Brigham Young University did some research a few years back and published it in the Journal of Oxidative Medicine and Cellular Longevity. 
Remember, in a recent podcast, we discussed oxidative stress and how that's related to free radicals. When you have free radicals in there and you have an excess of them in your body, then your body is undergoing oxidative stress. So that's what Brigham Young is looking at. They analyzed genes from about 6,000 United States adults, and they found that for every 1% increase in milk fat consumed, people had more than four years in additional biological aging. So it's advancing your age by four years for every 1% increase in milk fat that you drink. They were very surprised at how strong the difference was. And what it really means for us is that if we're going to consume milk that's high in fat content, we need to be aware that doing that is related to some significant consequences related to aging. So since this is not just oxidative medicine, but also cellular longevity in this article, they also analyze the length of telomeres. So telomeres are this component in your chromosomes, and they shorten with age. The shorter your chromosomes are, the more that you are aging, or the more quickly you're aging. Conversely, animals like lobsters that can live for a very, very long time, they tend to have longer telomeres. Ours are not really able to repair themselves, whereas the lobsters are somehow just able to keep on going. I know there's a scientific reason for it. I just can't remember it off the top of my head. So we're going to go with somehow. They also found in this research that saturated fat in high fat milk stresses out your cells and it can contribute to tissue death in the body. The more high fat milk you drink, the shorter your telomeres are going to be. So nearly half of the people in the study conducted by Brigham Young drank milk every day, and another one-fourth of the group drank milk at least once per week. One-third of those adults drank whole milk. Another 30% said that they drank 2%, and 10% drank 1% milk. 17% drank non-fat milk, and 13% did not drink cow milk. The study found that people who did not drink any milk had shorter telomeres than those who drank low-fat milk. So people who are not drinking any milk at all are aging quicker than people who drink skim milk. So it's not all bad. We do need a little bit of milk, but just not too much. And really... That's what we're learning as we go along in this podcast is that moderation is generally key. So which one do we pick in these cases? Whole milk is 3.25% milk fat, whereas reduced fat milk is only 2% and low fat milk 1%. Fat-free milk is the same as skin milk. So when people say they're drinking 2%, it's like, oh no, I, I prefer whole milk. It has a better flavors, way more, you know, milk fat there. It's only 1.25% more, which is interesting. I thought it would be a lot more than that, but it's only 3.25% milk fat for whole milk. Each type of milk has nine essential nutrients. That includes eight grams of really good quality protein. The types of milk are going to vary by their percentage of milk fat, as I illustrated, or the amount of fat that is in the milk by weight. It just depends on how the dairy producers average them. Then they put those percentages on the package and those different cap colors help you know at a glance, in the U.S. at least, which type of milk you're getting. Now, the amount of milk fat affects both the number of calories and the amount of fat in each serving. And all milk, including low-fat and fat-free milk to organic and lactose-free milk, has a bunch of natural nutrients in it. It's simple, wholesome food, and understanding those choices can help you pick out the best milk for you and your family. So skim milk has zero grams of fat and eight grams of protein. It's about 80 calories. 1% milk, 2.5 grams of fat, eight grams of protein. That's going to have 100 calories. 2% milk, five grams of fat, 8 grams of protein and 120 calories, whole milk, 8 grams of fat, 8 grams of protein, and 150 calories. So no matter which one you pick, you're still getting the same amount of milk protein. It's just also how you feel about the flavor, 
how you feel about the trade-off in your fat allowances for the day when you are counting your macros, and if you are paying attention to your calories as well, how many calories you want to accompany that protein intake. So here's really what you need to know. A ton of Americans opt for whole milk. So there's 150 calories in that 8-ounce glass of the whole milk with 8 grams of fat, 8 grams of protein. If you're worried about fat, there is good news here. As we discussed in a recent podcast episode, a lot of evidence is suggesting that not all saturated fats are the same. We talked about that in the oils and labels podcast. And some types of saturated fat, you really need it, especially for processing different types of vitamins and minerals. We need a little bit of fat, at least, to process certain things in our body and to help build important components of our body, like those cell membranes and stuff. Those are all made from fat. You see something that's talking about lipids, it's essentially talking about fats. There are some options, though, if you have a different taste preference or health needs, and we're going to go into that a little bit. So reduced fat milk is generally labeled as 2%, and as we said, that's 2% of the total weight of the milk is milk fat. Not that an 8-ounce glass itself contains 2% fat. So keep that in mind. That's just going to be 5 grams of fat. An 8-ounce glass of 2% is 5 grams of fat. Has the same 9 essential nutrients as every other type of milk. And that same 8 grams of protein. So with 2% milk, the only real difference in the nutrition facts is that it has three fewer grams of fat than whole milk, really, and five more grams of fat than skim milk. Low-fat milk is very similar in that regard, 2.5 grams of fat, 100 calories. That's the, the only difference, really. It's just your fat and your calories. Fat-free, if you want all the nutrients as whole milk but no calories and fat, then get fat-free or skim milk. Because it has less fat, it's going to, you know, not be as tasty because the things that taste good are those fats and those oils. That's why, where a lot of flavor comes from. That's why butter is delicious. It's not necessarily the milk. It's the milk fat. So people think that skim milk contains water to reduce that fat, but that's not how that works. It's still just milk, and it still has those nine essential ingredients. So if the flavor doesn't bother you then go ahead and swap over to skim. There's also a lot of organic milk now. We're in a bit of an organic craze these past few years. So a lot of dairies will produce organic milk. And that is covered by the USDA, who sets the standards for what the cows eat, how they're cared for, and how the milk itself is produced. Regardless of whether you're getting organic or conventional dairy milk, though, Keeping healthy cows leads to higher quality milk that is good for you. So that's all that real difference is. So we just want to make sure that when we look into the milk, if you see how the cows are treated, even if you don't care about it from an ethics and morality standpoint for the cows, if you think about it for your bodies, the better treated they are, the better quality that milk is going to be for you. So there's a couple different ways you can look at that. All different types of milk, regular, organic, flavored, white, they're all pretty safe and wholesome. I try to stay away from chocolate milk because they tend to have a lot of sugar added and milk already has its own sugar, but, you know, to each their own. If that's the only way you can get your child to drink milk is by helping having them drink chocolate milk or that's the only way you can stomach it, at least you're getting in your milk. I drink mine in my coffee. Who is to shame each other? Not us. There's no shame here. There's only better choices, not perfect choices. So because we have stricter standards, allegedly, with the USDA to govern our different types of milk, you know, it's supposed to be a lot safer for us and for our family to drink. And they do have to go through and have some things tested. You can also get lactose-free milk. That is real cow's milk, but it the only difference is that the natural sugar in it lactose is broken down so that makes it easier for people who are lactose intolerant to still drink milk 
you're getting those same nutrients, those same nine essential nutrients that are in all the other types of milk. You're still getting calcium, protein, vitamin D, etc. The lactose itself, the sugar, has been removed from it. So if you're looking to just remove sugar from your diet in general, you can also try to go for some lactose-free milk. It's going to make a difference for a lot of people depending on how you're feeling about it. Like, how, just listen to your body. Does milk make you feel icky after you drink it or does it make you feel better? Are you feeling lethargic or anything afterwards? You know, maybe try lessening how much of it is in your diet and going from there. For other people, like some people in my family, they are lactose intolerant. So they do drink a lot of lactose-free milk. And I grew up drinking that as well. Grew up on dairy farms and stuff. Grew up with people who were allergic to milk as well. It's a little bit different allergies versus lactose intolerance. But my point is I've, I've tasted so many different types of milk at this point. For me, it's mostly just not for me and it needs to be masked in something else. So chocolate milk for your kids, you know, put it in a protein shake for yourself in your coffee, just trying to get a little bit of milk. It, it can be really good for you. I've also had raw milk straight from the cow growing up on the, the dairy farms and stuff. And it's not pasteurized, and it's also not widely available for purchase because federal laws prohibit its distribution across state lines. And there are some safety concerns by the USDA, the FDA, and the Centers for Disease Control. I grew up drinking it, and I think I'm fine, but that doesn't mean that it is entirely safe. We pasteurize things for a reason, and, you know, I might have just been pretty lucky going along. So I'm not encouraging anyone to, you know, take chances with their health, but there are all kinds of different types of milk you can get out there. Now note that I said that federal laws prohibit it being distributed across state lines. That does mean that due to states' rights, some states can go ahead and sell it within the states, but you're just not able to take it from one state into another. You can't cross state lines with it in that way. All right, we're going to go on another break, and when we come back, we are going to talk about lactose intolerance. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. segment we were talking about the differences between different types of milk based on their fat content and also removing lactose from that milk. Next we're going to talk about lactose intolerance. So I'm sure that most of us know at least one person who experiences lactose intolerance. But what does that really mean beyond they can't have milk? So lactose intolerance means that they can't process milk normally but not just milk lactose specifically, so that sugar we were talking about that's found in milk and other dairy products. It's, you know, in ice cream, it's in yogurt, it's in all kinds of stuff. Lactose is broken down by an enzyme called lactase. Generally, if it ends in ASE, it is going to be an enzyme. And that enzyme, in particular lactase, is produced by cells that are found in the lining of your small intestine. There is also a disorder in some babies called congenital lactase deficiency or congenital alactasia. Congenital just means you're born with it. 
And children are unable to break down lactose in the form of breast milk or formula if they have this disorder. It can result in severe diarrhea in infants, and they have to have a lactose-free infant formula, or it can lead to severe hydration and weight loss in infants. So that can be very dangerous. But those two things are related, but the second is very specific to infants. Whereas lactose intolerance in adulthood tends to be produced by a reduction of lactase after infancy. It's called lactase non-persistence. So you are no longer creating lactase is all that means in Latin. If people who have lactose intolerance drink dairy products, I'm sure we've all seen this happen to our friends who are lactose intolerant, they can get stomach cramps, bloating, They get flatulence, nausea, and diarrhea like 30 minutes to 2 hours or so after they've eaten something that has milk in it. They can take lactate pills for that. They can also, you know, drink lactose-free milk to help out with that as well. Now, most people who have lactase non-persistence do still have some lactase activity in their bodies, and they can have a little bit of milk sometimes in their diets that lack that has lactose in it without having, you know, some really bad symptoms. If you are eating pizza, for example, if it's not lactose-free pizza, then your friend might take a lactate pill or they might, you know, be like, hey, I'm going to maybe get a pizza without the cheese on it as we like to eat it in America. But, you know, they can also still have some cheeses that are vegan So in that way, vegan cheese isn't just for people who are vegans or vegetarians trying to go vegan. If you have lactose intolerance, you can also eat vegan cheese. A lot of people complain that vegan cheese does not really melt well, but there is a brand called Daya, D-A-I-Y-A, that is made from water and tapioca flour and then a couple of oils that... It's actually pretty melty, according to my vegan friends. I haven't been able to try that one particularly yet. But, you know, if it melts, then I'm here for it. That's all I want in my cheese. just needs to be melty. It doesn't need to have lactose or anything specific in it. I want it to be melty and tasty. So you can try that one out, too. People who are affected by lactose non-persistence a lot of times have a hard time drinking fresh milk but they can eat cheese or yogurt in general without getting those stomach cramps or diarrhea or anything like that. That's because there's a fermentation process used to break down lactose in the milk. And that way, cheese doesn't bother a lot of people. Although, I also know a lot of people with lactase non-persistence who can't have cheese either. They can't have any dairy products. So lactose intolerance, really what we're saying is that it exists on a spectrum. If you have it in infancy from congenital lactase deficiency, that's a very rare disorder. They don't, they don't even know its incidence, really, and that is from the National Institute of Health. But that condition is the most common in Finland, interestingly, and it affects 1 in 60,000 newborns there. About 65% of the entire human population on this planet has a lot of trouble digesting lactose after infancy. So in adulthood, lactose intolerance is most prevalent in people of East Asian descent. That's about 70 to 100% of people in those communities that are affected by lactose intolerance. And it's also very common in people who have West African, Arabic, Jewish, Greek, or Italian ancestry. The prevalence of that is the lowest in populations who have a long history of dependence on unfermented milk products as they're, you know, a staple food source. So, for example, only approximately 5% of people who are of North European descent have lactose intolerance, which is why I think it's really interesting that Finland would have such a high amount of congenital lactase deficiency. But I guess, you know, if it's acquired as you're going along in life, And if it's found in older populations, that may be neither here nor there. Lactose intolerance can also have a couple different causes. In infants, it's caused by mutations in the LCT gene. And that gene gives your body instructions for making the lactase enzyme. So essentially, the blueprint is mutated. It's got 
stuff spilled on it if it were a physical one and it just doesn't work properly because you can't see the full picture to make the structure it needs to make. Any mutations that cause that are thought to interfere with the function of lactase, making these infants have a a lot of problems in digesting it in either breast milk or in formula. So it's the lactose itself that is the problem. So it doesn't matter that it's in breast milk or formula or cow's milk for these little ones. They can't really properly digest the lactose completely and all of those have lactose in it. So lactose intolerance in adulthood is caused by decreasing activity of the LCT gene. That is why it happens in so many humans and it's associated with aging. So if you know a lot of people who were older, like 55 and older, you may know a lot more of them who have lactose intolerance than you know younger people who have lactose intolerance. As we get older, our body just reduces our ability to really process the lactose because the lactase is not happening like it needs to be. LCT gene expression is caused by, or really controlled, by a DNA sequence that's called a regulatory element, and it's in a nearby gene called MCM6. Some people have inherited changes in that element, so you can pass it down from generation to generation, and leads to sustained lactase production in the small intestine and the ability to digest your lactose throughout life. People who don't have those changes are not able to really digest lactose as they get older. So you get the same signs and symptoms of lactose intolerance. Now for the inheritance pattern for that, it is autosomal recessive. So if you remember your Punnett squares from school, that means that both copies of the LCT gene in each cell have a mutation. The parents of a person who has an autosomal recessive condition That means they each have one copy of the mutated gene, but they don't typically show signs and symptoms of it. So you have to have two recessive genes in order to have that mutation. That means that your parents would have each had one copy of the dominant gene, which would be being able to actually process lactase, and one recessive gene that would cause you to not be able to process lactose properly because of something going on in the structure and function of the lactase. That is generally how it works. So usually parents of someone who has an autosomal recessive condition each carry one copy of the mutated gene and one of the other ones, but they don't show signs and symptoms because they don't have double recessive ones themselves. If they do, then that person is going to also be having difficulty in processing lactose. So if you and your mom are lactose intolerant, but your dad's not, then that probably means that your mom gave you one copy of the recessive one and your dad is home is heterozygous, sorry, heterozygous for it. So he had a dominant and a recessive one and you got the recessive one from him. So you are now autosomal recessive. You have two of the recessive genes. And that also means that your child is more likely to get it if you have a partner who is also lactose intolerant, or is carrying that gene just like the dad would in this scenario. The ability to really digest lactose in adulthood depends on any variations in that regulatory element within MCM6 that we discussed earlier. So when you inherit those from your parents, it could have multiple variations, and that can promote lactase production throughout your life. Remember, that one's autosomal dominant. And that means that one copy of the altered regulatory element in each cell is enough to sustain lactase production. So if you have one big one, one little one, just like your dad, then you don't have two little ones. And that means you are not going to have lactose intolerance. People who have not inherited those variations from either parent will have some degree of lactose intolerance as they get older, though. So you need one of those dominant genes in order to help you still make lactose. Sorry, lactase to process the lactose. All right, we're going to go on another break. And when we come back, we are going to talk about alternatives to milk. 
The GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast takes you on a journey of exploration. We'll discuss tried and true methods alongside the latest trends of how to best live your life to its fullest and happiest. From psychology to meditation, science to self-help books, the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast will help you to discover what makes you happy and how you can live life being the best you possible. Download the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or any where you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. segment we were talking about lactose intolerance how that is expressed genetically and how you can you know over time as we get older stop processing milk as well as we used to and it's like wow okay right like now like I'm you know 40 and now I can't process milk anymore I can't have ice cream that's a bummer but that happens to people as they get older I'm 31 right now that could happen to me as I get older so now milk alternatives What does it come down to? You have several options when you're looking for a good milk alternative. And a lot of my friends really enjoy these. Milk is one of those things for me where I'm like, ew, I don't like it, but I totally understand why other people do like it. You have a bunch of different choices, and these vary in their nutrition, their texture, their flavor, their color. It's just going to depend on which factors are more important to you. So first up, I think when we think of milk alternatives, a lot of us go straight to soy milk. It's a really popular alternative to dairy milk. A lot of grocery stores carry it. And it's a bean extract from soybeans that is generally in sweetened, unsweetened, and flavored varieties. So I've tried the sweetened one, the unsweetened one, and the vanilla kind. But some of them will come in chocolate as well. I can already tell you guys ahead of time, I did not like any of these different milks that I've tried. Um, And that's okay. I tried them, and at least I know that I tried it and I don't enjoy it. And sometimes that's all you can do is just determine, okay, well, that's not for me. And you don't need to beat yourself up about it. Just move forward with new knowledge. So with soy milk, though, it has a lot of nutritional equivalency to cow's milk. It's frequently fortified with vitamins and minerals like vitamin A, D, riboflavin, and it has about 8 to 10 grams of protein per serving. So that's going to be about the same as any of the other types of milk that we discussed earlier. Whole milk, 1%, 2%, skim milk, they all have that 8 grams of protein per serving no matter how much fat is in it. Soy milk can also contain something called isoflavones, And those have been associated with a reduced risk of heart disease. So if you are looking to reduce your risk of heart disease, maybe check out soy milk. On the other hand, though, even a little bit of soy milk can cause severe allergic reactions to people who have a soy allergy. So if you have lactose intolerance and a soy allergy, do not go with soy milk, obviously. A lot of people... You know, you guys intuitively know that, but some people don't know that they have that reaction until they try something that has soy in it when they've never had it before. So if you're trying soy for the first time, be very, you know, just be aware of what you're doing. Be mindful about it. Drink only a little bit of it at first and, you know, see how that personally affects you before you go and drink a whole bunch of it. They did a review in 2014 in the Journal of Alternative Therapies in Health and Medicine, and they revealed in that study that soy could negatively impact fertility in men. So I know we've heard that before a lot of us, that soy can cause some fertility issues with men. I believe they're related to estrogen. So if you have a hormone-sensitive cancer that's sensitive to like estrogen, then you may want to avoid soy milk. It's been linked to infertility in men as well for very similar reasons. So that's, you know, up to you. If you that's not something that's a factor in your life and that doesn't bother you, go for it. Try that soy milk and see if you prefer it. You can also use almond milk. 
So that one's made from ground almonds and water and generally some type of sweetener. Almond milk does tend to be sweet and creamy. It has a very similar texture and mouthfeel to dairy milk, but it depends on what you're looking for in it. Almond milk tends to have a lot of vitamin E in it, about 50% of your daily recommended allowance in a single cup. So that is a lot. Also, if you are trying to lose weight, almond milk has one third of the calories of 2% cow's milk. So that is quite a huge reduction. Almond milk, however, has less protein than dairy milk or soy milk by far. It also doesn't have all of those vitamins and minerals and fatty acids found in dairy milk. So you're going to need to make sure that if you do drink almond milk, that you look for one that is fortified. It, beyond just the vitamin E, the vitamin E is already in it naturally, but you need those other vitamins and minerals and fatty acids. So check it for the word fortified and then read the label and see what's on there beyond vitamin E. You can also try rice milk. So they boil the rice and then put brown rice syrup, brown rice starch in it, and that is a really popular alternative for cow's milk in a lot of circles, particularly vegan circles that I've seen. They also say it's the most hypoallergenic of milk alternatives, so it doesn't have soy, there's no gluten in it, there are no nuts in it, so you are going to have a lot easier time with rice milk if you have a lot of food allergies or lactose intolerance. If you are watching your weight, though, rice milk, it's made out of rice, so it's going to be super high in carbs. It's also very low in protein and calcium, especially when you compare it to dairy milk. And the texture is a lot different. It's thin and watery. So if you like skim milk and you're looking for an alternative, then rice milk might be a go-to for you. But if you're swapping from whole milk, you might want to, you know, work on a step-down program to get more comfortable and create those new normals for yourself before you just go straight from whole milk to rice milk because you are not going to enjoy that. I didn't like it. And my ex, he really likes... You know, rice milk, he likes, well, not rice milk, but he likes almond milk and a bunch of different types of milk, coconut milk, all that jazz. But when he drinks dairy milk, he prefers whole milk. So he's not that big into rice milk, even though he does like milk substitutes. So just be aware. It's really different depending on the person. It's going to, you know, matter whether you care about the macros that are in it versus the flavor versus the texture. I also wouldn't really use rice milk personally, for cooking or baking, it doesn't have a lot of those fats in it. And since it's also thin and watery, the consistency is different. And you really don't want to fool around with that with baking. Baking, I always say, is low stakes science. I mean, it's only low stakes if you don't do it for a living, but I don't. So for me, it is low stakes science. And it's going to potentially affect how your food comes out. Instead of rice milk, you can also try coconut milk. It's a pretty close alternative to cow's milk, and it is closest in texture to being like dairy milk. It does have a lot of fat in it, about 5 grams of saturated fat per cup. But remember, in coconut oil and coconut milk, those are some good types of saturated fat in there, and they're rare types that you can't find in a lot of other foods. So don't let the saturated component scare you off. It has a kind of a nutty flavor, to a lot of people, I don't really like coconut milk or coconuts, but not because of the milk part, but because I don't like coconut flavor. So this one's not for me. But the good news is, just like how you can use coconut oil to substitute one for one for butter in baking, you can also use coconut milk instead for a lot of baking because it has a very similar texture to it. It has those fats in it. It's also soy and gluten-free. So if you're having to make a dish for, you know, whether it's for work or whether it's for school stuff. If you have a lot of people with food allergies or you're just trying to be cognizant and considerate of that, then coconut milk can be a really good choice for that instead. It also has way more potassium per cup than dairy milk. Dairy milk only has 150 milligrams of potassium, whereas coconut milk has 630 milligrams per cup. So if it's no never mind to you as to which one you're drinking and you're just looking to have more potassium in your diet to help prevent cramps and stuff, go ahead, swap to coconut milk. It's going to help you by a lot, especially since it's like, what is that, like five times higher? 
It's crazy, but in a great way. Coconut milk also lacks the nutritional value of dairy milk, just like other types of milk substitutes. So one cup of coconut milk is 80 calories with only one gram of protein, whereas one cup of whole milk or skim milk even is eight grams of protein and 100 milligrams of calcium. Now, there are conversely 300 milligrams of calcium in 1% dairy milk alone. So that's going to be a big difference for you. And you're only preventing like two, let's see, 20 calories. There's only 20 calories difference between 1% dairy milk and coconut milk. So if you're doing it for the calories, if you're not going to get a big payoff there because it's only 20 calories lower, so it's, that's not a lot in the grand scheme. And you're also missing out on 200 milligrams of calcium and 7 grams of protein in the same amount of coconut milk versus dairy. So just think about what's more important to you and go from there. If you're getting your protein from another source or you're mixing that coconut milk with protein powder for after your workouts and stuff, then it probably also has more calcium in it. You can get a calcium fortified one. Just check your nutrition labels and maybe that can supplement and cancel each other out. For flax milk, that one's kind of thin and it's sweet. So it's sweet like like almond milk is, but it's going to be thin like rice milk is. And it's produced by organic, ethically responsible companies that use non-GMO flax. So if that's something that's important to you, keeping GMOs out of your food, then you might want to try flax milk. It has a high fiber content. It's also rich in alpha linoleic acids, and those have been used to prevent and treat heart and blood vessel related diseases. It's also used to prevent heart attacks, lower high blood pressure, lower cholesterol if you have a high LDL like me. Remember, HDL is the good one, LDL is the problem, and reverse hardening of your blood vessels. So if your blood vessels are already having a hard time, then flax milk can actually help you reduce that and kind of turn back the clock on it. When it is fortified, this has as much calcium as regular milk in it. So an unfortified flax milk is not going to have a ton of calcium in it, but it has almost as much if it is fortified. So just check for that fortified label again, and that can be really good for people who need a lot of calcium. Flax milk is low in protein though, so if your protein is an issue, you're not going to want flax milk unless you're supplementing it with like protein powder. Just keep that in mind. The flavored varieties are kind of heavily sweetened though with flax milk, so make sure you read that sugar content and see what type of sugar they've used for it. Remember, glucose is the good one. Fructose is the one we don't want. We especially don't want sucrose, as that is 55% fructose, 45% glucose. Yeah, that's right. So check out what kind of sugar it is, not just how much sugar. If you do hemp milk, you can't get high from it. I don't know whether to tell you I'm sorry or to reassure you. Depends on how you feel about hemp. But you will not get high off of hemp milk. It's made from hemp seeds that have been hulled, water, and generally also sweeteners. It can be a really good alternative for people who have soy, nut, or gluten allergies. Gluten is not in hemp. It's gluten-free. So if that's a concern, there you go. It provides way more iron for you than cow's milk does. And it's very high in omega-3 fatty acids. So remember those omega-3 fatty acids can promote heart and brain health, and they also can help reduce inflammation. Omega-6s cause inflammation to go up. Omega-3s cause it to reduce. So if you have a lot of inflammation in your body and you're looking for a milk to help you address that, try hemp milk. So unless it's fortified, though, it is relatively low in calcium, Remember, we can get other things to fortify our calcium. We don't want to turn to supplements per se, but we can get it in other forms. It is rather expensive too, and it can have like a nutty flavor. Some people describe it as tasting kind of like beans, kind of like pentos, I think. But it just depends on your own palate. Some people think that cilantro tastes like soap. I think it's delicious. So that is up to you. It might not suit some taste buds, though. Keep that in mind. And it may taste a little bit different if you try to put it into food. 
It also has a lot of sugar added in a lot of store varieties. So read that label just like you would for that flax milk. We're going to go on another break. And when we come back, we are going to talk about calcium. Are you tired of the same old news? Are you sick of the seemingly endless political spin and negativity? The GSMC America Still Beautiful podcast is a weekly news podcast covering all the top positive and uplifting news stories. We cover stories that will inspire, uplift, and remind you of the good in the world. Tune into the Golden State Media Concepts America Still Beautiful podcast to get all the great and positive news stories of today. Download the GSMC America Still Beautiful podcast on iTunes. Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. segment we were talking about different types of milk alternatives and reasons why you might seek each of those out. Now we're going to talk a little bit about calcium. So calcium is really important to our bodies. You've probably heard that it's good for your bones and it's good for health, but how? Let's talk about it. Calcium is a mineral that the body really needs for a whole different host of functions. It's important for building and maintaining bones and teeth, which means it's also important for repairing your bones. It's important for blood clotting, transmitting nerve impulses, and regulating your heart rhythm. About 99% of your whole body's calcium is really stored in your bones and your teeth, which I think is really cool. And the remaining 1% is in your blood, your muscle, and your other tissues. So most of it, though, is going to be in your bones and teeth. Your body gets it in a couple of different ways. You can get it by eating foods or supplements, if you have to, that contain calcium. And the other is by just drawing on calcium stores in your body. So it's pulling it from your bones. There are really good food sources that have a ton of calcium. You don't have to get it just from milk or milk alternatives. You can get it from salmon, dark leafy greens. You can get it from soy foods if you don't have a soy allergy. You can get it from beans in general. All of these have varying amounts of absorbable calcium. So keep that in mind. It doesn't matter. It's just, you know, calcium in general. You want to make sure that you can actually absorb it. But you can get it from all kinds of different stuff. So if you're doing that flax milk or that hemp milk that's very low in protein, not protein, it's very low in calcium, then you're going to want to try maybe salmon or different types of beans or greens. So you can still be vegetarian and or vegan and get those amounts of calcium that you're missing from getting, you know, dairy products and stuff. It's not, dairy's not the only way to get it. If you don't eat enough calcium containing foods, your body will leach it from the bones. It's called borrowed calcium And ideally, it'll get replaced at a later point, but that does not always happen. And the payback can't be accomplished just by eating or ingesting more calcium. That happened to my grandmother, actually, when she was pregnant. Um, She had, she was older when it happened, and she had the calcium leach from her bones as she was trying to get enough for the baby. And that was a very big problem. It caused problems with her teeth and with her bones. So as women, we particularly have to be cognizant of how much calcium we're intaking. And we really need to keep an eye on it as we're pregnant because it can cause some wacky stuff. So this was, you know, 55, 60 years ago when this was happening. But it's it was it was a big deal. I remember she already had dentures when I was a small child, and that is what it was from, was actually from her pregnancy, not from anything else of brushing her teeth or just in getting older. The calcium was just leached from her body. So if you don't eat enough calcium-containing foods and it leaches it from your bones, it can be bad news bears. I've seen it happen in real life. 
retroactively. If to grow healthy bones, though, you do need calcium. Your bones are actually always remodeling themselves. You have these osteoclasts that break down your bones and osteoblasts that rebuild bone. So that's a, a really basic level of understanding of what these osteoclasts and osteoblasts do. But they participate in this together in a process called remodeling. So it's just bony remodeling. Those osteoclasts take away the old bone, osteoblasts deposit new bone, and if you need more calcium, they're going to go ahead and start that process, which we are always needing more calcium, so they're always doing it. In healthy people who get enough calcium and physical activity, bone production is going to exceed the amount of bone destruction by those osteoclasts up until about age 30. After that, destruction typically is going to exceed production. That is kind of where osteoporosis comes in. So as we're getting older, osteoporosis, that's just Latin for porous bones. So it's just like essentially little holes, little pores in the bones. And it's weakening of them causes an imbalance between your bone building and your bone destruction. So it, you're already after age 30 having difficulty with that because it's being destroyed at a much higher rate than the osteoblasts are able to produce more bone. And people typically lose bone as they age. So there's nothing that we can really do to entirely prevent that. No matter if you consume your recommended daily intake of calcium to maintain that optimum bone health, you can still have a lot of problems with it. So if you are... Over a certain age, you're supposed to be going to your doctor all the time for your bone scans, especially looking at you ladies. We are disproportionately affected by that. Make sure that you still go and get those bone density scans done. Even if you are drinking enough milk, you're drinking tons of milk, it can still cause a problem. It's an estimated 10 million Americans, 8 million women, and 2 million men who have osteoporosis in America. So that means that women, we are like four times more likely to have this problem than men are. Another 34 million Americans have low bone mass, and that places you at an increased risk for osteoporosis. So think of that kind of like pre-diabetes when we were talking about that the other day. So you can come back from low bone mass, but you want to do that before it gets to the osteoporosis stage. So if you aren't You know, in taking a lot of calcium right now, go get some calcium from your fridge. Get some salmon, some dark leafy greens, doesn't have to be milk, and have a bowl of that tonight. I think cereal is a great uh, nighttime snack as well. I would rather eat cereal at night than in the morning, to be honest. Getting enough calcium, though, and maximizing your bone stores during a time when bone is rapidly deposited. So if you're not age 30 yet, talking to you. That's going to provide an important foundation for the future. It won't prevent bone loss later in life, but it's going to help give your bones a really solid beginning. Any bone loss that's a result of aging is coming from several different factors. It's related to genetics, how physically active you are, and how what your levels are of your circulating hormones. Estrogen for women, testosterone for men. So the more active you are, the better off your bones are going to be. The more active you are, the higher levels of those circulating hormones are going to be. And you generally want that. Because if you don't have it, then you're going to lose more bone. So postmenopausal women account for 80% of all cases of osteoporosis, according to Harvard Health. And that is because estrogen production is declining at menopause. So Your calcium stores, your bone porosity is related to your hormones. So when women start menopause, then we have trouble with our estrogen production declining, and so our bones are not able to keep up. That's a big reason why it disproportionately affects women rather than men, because men are able to continue reproducing as they go. Those testosterone levels may die down a little bit, but it's not to the same degree that it generally is for women. Men are also at risk of developing osteoporosis, but they do tend to do so 5 to 10 years after women. It's just not that abrupt for the testosterone like it is for menopause. 
a lot of women who also have certain types of cancers will have hormones, hormone sensitivity to it. So your cancers can be hormone sensitive. We talked about that a little bit earlier with like breast cancer and prostate cancer. And with women, if you have to go through chemo and radiation, sometimes that can cause you to prematurely go into menopause. So even if you're not at that age yet, osteoporosis can be a big problem or a big risk if you are undergoing chemo for any type of disorder that you have to have chemo for. So keep that in mind. Your doctor probably mentioned it to you. If you have cancer, I'm sure I am preaching to the choir at this point. This is mostly for people who don't know that you can also get osteoporosis from chemotherapy as a side effect. Now, it is estimated that osteoporosis will cause half of all women over age 50 to fracture their hip, their wrist, or their vertebra, so your spinal column. That's kind of scary to me as a woman. So we want to try to slow down the possibility of osteoporosis. So how do we do that? We try to make our bones the strongest and densest that we can during our first 30 years of life. So... Young people, looking at you, I did not drink enough milk in my teens and 20s, or even when I was a small child. I thought it was disgusting even when I was little. So I didn't probably get enough uh, milk to give myself the best start I could. I was mostly drinking Dr. Pepper, and that has no nutrients, really. So I would advise you guys to drink more milk. Now, I didn't take advice from people who told me to drink more milk when I was younger. So that is... Neither here nor there. I'm not trying to be a hypocrite. I am just talking from experience. I'm 31. My bones hurt, you guys. I've been working on it. It's been working a lot better since I've been working out a lot. It is helping my bone density by remodeling the places where you're using those muscles a lot. You have muscle attachment sites on your bones. And when you see a skeleton and you see those little rough areas, that's the parts that had those muscle attachment sites. They have to be kind of rough to help the bones hold on to it. The rougher they are, the more robust your muscles tended to be. So we want to make sure that we are using these muscles a lot to increase that some of that bone robusticity and also to impact our bone density. Whenever your osteoclasts and osteoblasts are breaking down and rebuilding things, they're just doing that as part of the normal life process, but they will also do it in areas that are disproportionately worked out. So lifting weights can be really good for you in that way. Cardio is for the most part for your heart and for your lungs. What you're really going to be getting a lot of benefit from for your bones is going to be weightlifting. And you don't have to weightlift a lot. Start out little. I started out really low, especially because I have a bum knee, but I did leg day yesterday and I went up another 10 pounds on the resistance for what I'm using because I've been doing it somewhat consistently. I've been doing leg day at least once a week recently. You don't want to overdo it. I make sure that my body recovers before I do leg day again. But up next, I'm going to have to do arm day, my chest and back arms, so that I can have some more upper body strength, but also to make the rest of my bones more dense, rather I'm just trying to give my bones the best possible chance that they can have. And if you don't have a lot of upper body strength in general, free weights, soup cans, anything like that is going to help you out. Make sure that you're keeping the weights pretty low, especially if you're just starting out um, and you are trying to work with osteoporosis. You don't want to overstress them. Listen to your body. It will let you know when something is too much. And when something is finally just enough, you want it to to be a little bit difficult, but you don't want to be stressing yourself or hurting yourself when you're working out. That means the weight is too high right now. You can work your way up to it, though. I believe in you. Now, once you are out of your 30s, there are a couple of other things that you can do to prevent or minimize bone loss during adulthood and especially in older age. So I already said weight-bearing exercises. Super important. If it works out your muscles, it's also generally going to work out your bones. Getting enough vitamin D is also important. 
Remember, you can get that through supplements, but we should try to get most of it through our diets and exposure to sunshine. We get about 90% of our vitamin D, particularly D3, from sun exposure and then 10% from our diets. So make sure that we're going outside for a little bit. When I went to the gym yesterday, I laid out on that pool chair for a little bit and got some sun before I came back inside. It was nice. I got to cool off a little bit and... You know, everybody's already sweaty anyway when they're laying on the sun chairs, so I don't feel so bad about that. To each their own. But other than that, you can also make sure you're intaking enough calcium, and that will reduce the amount your body has to borrow from bone. Make sure that you get enough vitamin K that is in green leafy vegetables. It's also good for your skin. And you want to get... You want to get vitamin A naturally, but you don't want to get too much preformed vitamin A. So just be careful with your vitamin A intake. It's really good for like under eye bags, but you don't want to get too much. Remember, all things in moderation, you can have too much of a good thing. Uh, swimming, I do want to point that one out. If you do have a lot of bone pain, swimming can be really useful for your exercise and that is mostly going to be for your heart and cardiovascular system. So you can go ahead and get in the pool for your heart and your cardiovascular system. But since water is good for bad, not, I don't want to say bad bones. Our bones are doing the best they can. But, you know, bones that are a little bit sore or achy per se. Remember that working out in the pool is meant to take some of that weight off of your bones and take some of that stress off of it. So working out via swimming is going to be usually considered cardio. It's not really good for weight-bearing exercises. So make sure if you are swimming and you are kind of confronting osteoporosis or like, you know, the pre-diabetes version of osteoporosis and bone loss, then you're going to need to try a variety of activities to keep your bones healthy. It's nice to be able to get into the water and take the pressure and the stress off of those joints long enough to get some cardio. And I do a lot of, of swimming for cardio during the summer and everything because it's just easier on my knee than doing a treadmill or something. So I'll either do, I do the bike machines, I do swimming, I do Stairmasters and ellipticals generally with my bad knee. But, um, it's not going to help me in swimming for weight-bearing exercises. So try, you know, just some lifting weights. You can also do dancing, walking, jogging. That's just using your own body weight and helping your bones get used to bearing the weight of the rest of your body. That's really all it is. There are tons of exercises like that, and I encourage you to start with that. You can do stair climbing, so you can actually just climb regular stairs if you don't have a stair master around you can play racket sports so racquetball you could do you know I'm not, ping, ping pong won't count for that ping pong's a lot of fun but it's you're not getting a lot of oomph behind it so you need like tennis or racquetball hiking will even do it if you aren't interested in weightlifting so you have a lot of options but getting regular exercise is going to help a lot remember if you're just starting out it is okay to start out with the little things do it for five minutes. Do it with soup cans. Whatever you need to do that is safe and healthy to get started is good. Even if you only do five minutes, I want you to pat yourself on the back. I'm over here cheering for you because I started out just doing it a few minutes at a time and gradually I'm working my way up. I think that it's important to celebrate the little wins. We've talked about that a little bit before. I believe in you. Let's keep it rolling in 2020 with doing our New Year's resolutions as we start to move into February. All right, we're going to take another break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about fun ways to use milk externally. If we can't put it in our bodies, maybe we can put it on them. See you in a second. 
GSMC Beauty Tips Podcast gives you advice on everything from hair to fashion to skincare products. We'll talk about the latest trends in makeup, hairstyles, and anti-aging remedies. And we'll cover all of the newest fashion trends. If you have an interest in or questions about the beauty trends that might work best for you, the Golden State Media Concepts Beauty Tips Podcast has got you covered. Download the GSMC Beauty Tips Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Welcome back. In our last segment, we were talking about calcium, how that tends to work with our bodies, how our bones build up new stores of calcium in our bodies to work on our bones and prevent osteoporosis. So now we're going to talk about ways that we can use milk on our bodies, even if we are not fans of putting it in our bodies. Milk has a ton of different effects for your skin and your hair. So we talked about how milk has a ton of these vitamins and proteins in it, and they can be really good for putting some shine and luster in your hair as well as strengthening its structure. A lot of hairstylists have women rinsing their hair with milk to impart some shine to their hair. You know, I like to put water in it afterwards, kind of rinse it out. Some of my friends over the years have used mayonnaise, flat beer, eggs, all kinds of stuff in their hair for hair masks. And today we're really just going to focus on milk, but there are a lot of different options out there. Milk works like any other alpha hydroxy acid product to help exfoliate and remove debris to make your hair softer. So if you are buying some hair products that have alpha hydroxy acid in it to help get some of the buildup from shampoos and conditioners out of your hair, you can also just try milk if you're curious. And if that is not enough, then a lot of cosmetic chemists will also tell you that you can use milk to add weight to your hair. That is the secret to keratin, which is what your hair and nails are made out of, and smoothing treatments. So it's going to help kind of seal your hair, put some weight in it a little bit. I've also read that whole milk can be used as a straightener, which I think is very interesting, but I am not here for that. But they say that you can put honey, strawberries, and banana in it for a nice smell and extra nourishment. What you're going to do is totally saturate your hair with the concoction. You can just do that with your hands. Or you can put it in a spray bottle if you want. It's going to be hard with honey and strawberries and banana in it. So I would maybe stay away from the spray bottle if you're putting all of the fruits and honey in there. But if you are just, you know, going to rub it into your hair, then go ahead and, you know, I I would definitely blend that down first, though. That's the word I was looking for. So blend down the strawberries and the banana before you saturate your hair with it. Otherwise, you're just going to have chunks of strawberries and bananas falling out of your hair. Then you're going to comb your hair or they say pull at it for like 20 to 30 minutes. Then you're going to rinse it, then shampoo, then condition. So this is just an extra hair treatment. You're not going to leave it in there. Your hair is not just going to smell like honey and bananas and strawberries. But they say if you air dry it after doing that treatment, it'll give you a surprisingly straight look. So if that's something that you're looking for, check that out. If you think it's gross to put whole milk on your hair, you can do a leave-in treatment. There's a product called Milk that is not just milk itself, but rather something that is infused with like 16 essential oils and stuff to get a very similar shine. So it's just meant to do the same thing that milk would do to your hair, but it's going to smell different and it's a leave-in treatment. Now, I am not so keen on the idea of bathing or swimming in milk, but my mom has been a big proponent of that since I was a kid. She's like, oh yeah, take a milk bath. It's really good for your skin. And it, she's right, it is, because it works like a natural skin softener. If you have, like, pure milk, so not chocolate milk, 
or strawberry milk or anything like that, just regular milk. It's super soothing and hydrating for your skin. So you can do a, a milk bath, a cold milk bath or a topical beauty product with milk as a main ingredient that can really help moisturize your skin. And if it's irritated, it can also help that a little bit too. It depends on the type of irritation. I would not be rubbing milk into open wounds. I don't think it's going to necessarily hurt anything. It just sounds gross to me. So, you know, if you have a lot of open wounds, maybe maybe hold off on the milk bath. But if you are good to go and you just have some dry, irritated areas, try it out. Heck, I might try it next time I have an eczema breakout because nothing else really works that well. Why not try milk? You can also use milk to slough off dead skin cells because it contains lactic acid. If you have sensitive skin, though, the lactic acid can feel like it stings, kind of. So be careful or mindful, really, with that. Maybe just try it on a small area first and see if it stings, just like you would, you know, check laundry detergent on a specific new type of material just to see how it affects it. You can also use low-sugar yogurt because that has some probiotics in it, and that can help you keep your skin free from breakouts because probiotics really just keep bacteria in check. And if you have a lot of acne, generally that can be associated with, you know, some bacteria in your sebaceous glands. So if you want to keep your skin free of breakouts, you can try eating low sugar yogurts or using them in your skincare routine. So I like to do a yogurt and honey face mask sometimes. Sometimes I'll chop up some avocado and put it in there. And I generally use sugar-free Greek yogurt. I'm not going to eat the yogurt. It's just good. It's just for my face. But it can help keep your skin cleared of some of that bacteria. Now, the reason you want it to be low sugar or sugar-free is because a lot of bacteria do feed on sugar. So do a lot of the other flora on your body, like candida. We don't want to be giving them a lot of opportunity for growth. They are all in a kind of a delicate balance with each other. So don't add any sugar to your face, even though it's not going in your body. It can be bad to put it on your body. But honey is supposed to be a natural antimicrobial. So you can put honey on there, even though it has sugar or sweetened. It's, it's sweet. You can still put it on your face, though. You just don't want any, like, added sugars and stuff in it. Now, you can also use, like, a milk-intensive hydrating treatment or goat's milk is a big one that I love. So for goat's milk, I grew up with goats at my house, and we also had to milk the neighbor's goats a lot. That's just something that everybody does when you live around a farm as everybody chips in. So I've been milking goats and cows for years, and goat's milk is amazing. I love goat's milk because if you, like, squeeze it at somebody, if you squeeze an udder at somebody while the goat is eating, so it's not even paying attention, but you can squirt them in the mouth with it, and it tastes like warm vanilla ice cream. And it's so funny. We used to squirt milk at each other all the time on the farm. It's just something weird that farm kids do. But you can also make goat's milk soap. You can make goat's milk butter. Like, you can make butter, you can make cheese, you can make anything out of goat's milk if you want it bad enough. And with goat's milk soap, we would do it one of two ways. You can do a hot process or a cold process, and one of those you heat it up on the stove. The other one, you use lye to produce that chemical reaction instead. And then it sits for about 14 days. And because it has lye in it, you have to pour it into a plastic mold rather than a metal one because it'll eat through it. It's so wacky how science works. But it was super cool to do it. You can put coffee grounds in it. You can put lavender essential oils in it. It just depends on what you want it to smell like, whether you want it to be an exfoliating soap versus just a moisturizing one. But we make these all the time with my friend Marielle growing up. And when we would make these soaps, it I would use them on my hair and on my body. Even though they had lye and stuff in them, they were fine. And my hair would actually squeak when I would run my hands over it after I had rinsed it out. It feels weird in the moment. But it's kind of taking a lot of the buildup out of your hair because it's milk. Just like how it works with cow milk, you can do it with goat's milk. And it it strips all of the, the buildup out. And then your hair literally feels squeaky clean. And you think it's going to be bad because you didn't put a coat, a 
coconut. You didn't put a conditioner in it. And my conditioner is coconut. That's why I said that. So if you don't put a conditioner in it, then you think that it's going to make your hair really dry. But that has not been my experience with goat's milk soap. It has actually been really great for my hair. It makes it really soft. I really enjoy it. My skin feels pretty moisturized. I still use a moisturizer after I get out, no matter how moisturizing my soap is. I just like to have very soft skin and I like for my skin to be moisturized and not dry. But it with goat's milk soap, it's going to feel really nice. So if you guys haven't tried that out, you can get that from a lot of different stores nowadays. You can also get it at a ton of different like farmers markets, flea markets, stuff like that. And it's amazing. People just make it on their porch, really. And I highly recommend it. Now, those fat molecules in this goat's milk soap can not only be hydrating, but they also help lock in moisture and keep the outer barrier of your skin intact. So that's protecting your pores from pollution and from bacteria. So putting goat's milk on your face can help quench your skin's thirst. So even if you're not drinking it, you can really use it on your skin. It also has a ton of lactic acid. So that's another alpha hydroxy acid that's going to gently help you with skin cell exfoliation. So it kind of acts like a light exfoliator and a gentle peel. So it's not going to hurt you that much. It's not, well, it's not going to hurt you at all generally, unless you know, you have an allergy that you weren't aware of, but it's going to help get off that those old skin cells, just like a peel or an exfoliator would. And because of that lactic acid, if you consistently use it, it's going to help brighten your skin with very little irritation. If you do experience irritation with it, go ahead, stop using it. That's uh, It shouldn't be doing that. It doesn't do that for most people. Goat milk also contains vitamin A, which theoretically is supposed to be helpful in regulating the turnover of skin. So how frequently your skin cells renew. Just like bone cells are constantly remodeling, your skin cells are also making new skin cells. It helps reduce fine lines and wrinkles. That's why we put vitamin A or retinol uh, underneath our eyes. And it can also help improve acne. So definitely check out goat's milk in particular, but milk in general for using milk on your body to help you with your skincare. If you have a dairy allergy though, Dr. Zeichner recommends not applying a goat milk based product or a, any milk based product to your skin if it is dairy related. There is a chance of bacterial contamination as well if the product is not stored safely. So keep the container sealed tightly, store it in a cool dry place, Make sure that if you're using a bar of soap that you dry it before you put it up. It needs to be totally dry so it doesn't grow bacteria on the outside. Bar soap in general, just as a pro tip, is not as good for you typically as pump soaps because the bar soaps sit there with the bacteria from your hands on them and the moisture. So it really helps bacteria to proliferate. We did a study on that in my microbiology class and really what's helping your hands get clean is friction. Um, and being underneath the water, it's not the soap itself in most cases. But hand soaps are less effective than pump soaps. Or bar soaps are less effective than pump soaps when it comes to hand soaps. So keep that in mind. All right, guys, that is all we have for today about milk. Thank you for listening to the GSMC Health and Wellness Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I would like to ask that you please remember to subscribe to the show And writing a nice review always really helps us. Also, if you can please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, I'd appreciate it. Thank you kindly, and have a good night. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Health and Wellness Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies 
movies to music from sports to entertainment and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.